Hi, I'm Dimitri, the Children's Director here at Buffalo Free Church. I want to thank you for joining us in our online service. Before we get started in our time of worship with the Lord, I just have a couple of announcements. The first is a big one, guys and ladies. March 7th, the, the second service will begin at 10.30 a.m. Now, this may not apply as much to our online, but if you are checking out online or coming in and you're kind of in the mix of doing both, just know the first Sunday in March, March 7th, our second service starts at 10.30 a.m. We want to respect your time and get you out of church a little bit early so you can enjoy time with your family. What a sweet treasure that is. So March 7th, second service starts at 10.30 a.m. And I want to remind you to sign up for our Engage app. It's a wonderful website and app that allows you to connect through with anybody in the church at any time. It's incredibly helpful, especially if you're volunteering for a ministry. Talk to your ministry director or leader about what that looks like and how that can benefit you. I want to remind you, sign up for our Engage app. It's helped me a lot, honestly, especially through the tough times we're having. Just being able to call and check in on people is such a gift. Also, men's overhaul. That is happening March 5th through 7th, and you can sign up at our website. So that is an event that happens at Camp Shaminal. I haven't been to it before. I'm going to it this year. I am super excited, and you can sign up through our website. You can go on the men's ministry page, or you can go on our bulletin and sign up that way. I encourage you men to go build community, have a good time, and just let go of some of those responsibilities and have fun. I encourage it. I'm excited about it. And last but not least, March 12th, we are having a parenting event here at the church, and it's called Parenting Through the Phases. Pastor Braxton and Pastor Greg have spent so much time doing this, and it is going to be wonderful to connect with parents who are in a similar phase of life as you. Parenting is hard. There are ups and downs and sometimes more downs and sometimes more ups. It is hard. I encourage you to build a community of people who are in the same phase of life as you. So March 12th, Parenting Through the Phases. You can sign up for that through our church website, for our family resources, or through our bulletin. All right, let's start worship. This morning has we come to the pastoral prayer. We are in Psalm 130. This is a fitting psalm for what has gone on in this last week. You and I have been shocked. We've cried out, not in our community, not in our world should this happen. You may have known some of those who were hurt because many of you attend and use the facility there at the Alina Clinic. Some of you may have been in the clinic. Some of you may know of people who have been in the clinic. And you've also had people who were part of the fire and the, the hospital and, and the police departments and the law enforcement. And you are grieving this morning. Your heart is broken. As we come to prayer, Listen to what the psalmist writes. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Sounds like God knew we needed this, this passage this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, we cry out. We cry out for those who were involved. We think of the victims from the shooting. We pray for the family that has lost a mother, a wife, a loved one. We think of those who are now recovering and, and trying to get back to, to health and the struggles they are facing due to the injuries. We think of those who were patients in the building at the time and pray for your comfort, pray for you to show your mercy upon their hearts. We pray for those who were there as, as staff, helping their friends who were hurt or, or trying to escape to, to be safe. We pray for them. 
We pray for the first responders, the medical, the fire who came in and helped with the scene. We think of the law enforcement who came in and we pray for them. We ask that you would encourage them. We pray for our children in the schools who, who are still processing what went on, just like we adults are, Father. And we ask that you would have your hand of protection on our children. We pray for us as a community, Father. We need your mercy. We need your care. He goes on. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. In other words, God's heart is always moving towards us. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is a steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Father, we come to you. We wait for you. We cry out for you. We thank you that you are a God moving towards us, a God that cares about us, a God that's eager to, to envelop us in this steadfast love, this love that does not end this love that reaches and reaches and reaches and that you provide hope and father for our community for our friends for ourselves we pray that we may know the hope of jesus christ the hope he desires to shower on this community and i i ask this father and i pray for the one who caused the problem i pray for his soul as well. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we worship God? It occurs to me that Scripture tells us that it is the acknowledgement of who God is and who Jesus is that when we call upon his name, it's an acknowledgement of his power, his authority, that we acknowledge who he is in our lives. There's such power even just in the name of Jesus, right? You join me as we celebrate the strength and power and how wonderful his name is. One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name. beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus you didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven Not whole. 
church worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath
upon his name, as we draw close to God, as we invite him into all of those areas of our lives where we're complacent about sin, where we want our new growth, where we acknowledge and accept and recognize the fact that we have strayed away, that we've moved away from, from God. so easy to become complacent. To stand in the knowledge of knowing who God is and how much he loves us, but not surrendering our lives to be changed by him. I want new growth, Lord. Let us have new growth. Let's not be comfortable in any place that we are, thinking it's of our own strength and our own will and that is getting us and driving us to where we need to be, Lord. Remind us every day and in every moment this week that we need you. Our strength doesn't lie in ourselves. It lies in you. So we need you. And we call upon your name, Lord. Your powerful, wonderful, beautiful name. Thank you for this time together to worship today. I ask blessings and safety on all of us as we go. Praying for those who are this gentleman this morning who needed a warm place last night. Thank you for the provision of that need. Thank you for the word being provided to him and being made known to him. Let it be as sacred to us today, Lord, as it is to him today to have it in his hands. We love you, Lord. We give you all the thanks and may you be glorified in all things. Amen. Today we begin a brand new series called Greater, Jesus in the Book of Hebrews. But as you think about this last week, you may be thinking, why? What does this book have to do with our tragedy? What does this book have to do with people in the 21st century? This, this time of social unrest, this time of, of disease, people losing their jobs, people struggling with their health, and then the tragedy of, that we just experienced, why pick this book, Pastor? I mean, Pastor, this is, this is considered one of the hardest books to know in the Bible. It's one of the most difficult. It talks about obscure Old Testament people. It quotes a lot of Old Testament scripture. In fact, there's like 60 quotations. It speaks of gross things like animal sacrifices. What? does it have to do with us? Is there anything it can give us? I will answer that by telling you who this book was written for. It was a people who were tired. Can you relate to that? It was a people who had been run out of their homes because of their faith. We believe that they were Christians who were persecuted and run out of Rome, run out of Alexandria, and now they're returning. But because they are Jewish Christians, they don't fit in with the Gentile Christians. They are ostracized from their Jewish friends. They are still being persecuted by Rome. If you were to look up exhaustion in the dictionary, their picture would be there. They're tired. They're tired of turning the other cheek. They're tired of serving this world in the name of Jesus Christ. They're tired of worship. They're tired of going to church. They're tired of studying their faith. They're tired of being different, of being a people that were whispered about, mocked, and hated just because they were Christians. They're tired spiritually. They're even too tired to pray. If you saw them on a Sunday morning, their hands are wilting. Their knees are weak. They find reasons not to be at church, not to be with their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
They're losing their confidence. They're losing their joy. They're losing their faith. And they're not going to sprint off. They're not going to walk off. They're not even going to crawl off to, into another direction because they don't have the strength. As one writer said, they're worn out and worn down. The fear is that they will simply drop their end of the rope and simply drift away. That they do not want to walk the walk or talk the talk because they're too tired to care. They're considering walking away. And it's away from their faith, their family. And they're going to do it quietly. Is that you this morning? Are you tired? Are you tired of fighting for your faith, fighting for your family, fighting for your health, fighting for your loved ones, fighting against a world that doesn't make sense anymore? It seems you have one gasp of air and then your head is pushed beneath the waves. Then this book's for you. This is what the writer is going to address. But he's not going to use a five-step program. He's not going to give you an easy out. He's going to ask you one simple question. How big is your Jesus? He is not going to take it easy on you. Most of the books of the Bible begin with an introduction, not Hebrews. He is going to throw you into the deep end of the pool. He is going to make you jump in and say you need to swim. Or better yet, walk on the water because you're holding the hand of the one who's greater. Notice how it begins in chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. There was a thing on the news recently. It's the 50th anniversary of a song that began long, long time ago. It's a storytelling technique. You might recall in the early Star Wars it said long ago in a galaxy far away. But it has a bigger purpose than just simply telling a story here. It's to show you and I that Jesus hasn't come from a vacuum. He didn't just appear, die on the cross, and wow this is amazing. But it was part of an ongoing plan. He is part of the great narrative of Scripture. God at work towards a pinnacle of everything, and that everything is Jesus as he rescues humanity. The prophets. The prophets were the speakers for God. God spoke through visions. He spoke through dreams. He spoke through a burning bush. He spoke through a donkey. He spoke through writing on walls. He spoke on a whirlwind. He spoke out of songs. And the writer begins with the prophets because the Messiah, the Savior, will hold three key positions. He will be a prophet. He will be a priest. He will be a king. And these next verses show us how Jesus not only fulfills those roles, but he exceeds those roles. He is greater. So let's look at the next part. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Literally, this is in son. He has spoken in son. He is not only the son, but he is the inheritor of everything. We will see in just a moment. But he is the expression of God's thoughts, the final expressions in these last days. And the writer is pointing out three key truths about Jesus. The first truth will be his authority. Jesus has authority because he is not only speaking the words of God, he is the word of God. He has authority because he is not a prophet, but he is a son the Son, in whom he appointed the heir of all things. This is, here's his authority. He's not only the Son, but he's the inheritor of everything. The heir is the heart of the Father. He is the one the Father invests everything for. 
Jesus is the heir. He gets it all. Everything the Father has done through creation, through his work on earth, is for one and only Jesus. I like what one pastor said. The prophets were pointing towards something. And Jesus was that something. He is the point of it all. The second truth we see is not only does Jesus have authority, he has power. Through whom he also created the world. And, he, and we're going to jump and add a little verse. You're going to jump down. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Elizabeth Elliot, the author and missionary of the past, wrote this. Think about it. If the distance between earth and the sun was the thickness of one sheet of paper, then the distance from the earth to the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. The diameter of our galaxy would be a stack of paper 310 miles high. And our galaxy is only a speck of dust in the universe. And Jesus created all this by his word, and he's the one who holds it together. Jesus is the greatest and he has the power to prove it. But we also see his identity. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He is the radiance. He exudes. He leaks out the glory of God. It comes from him. Why? Because he is God. And notice that word exact imprint. There's two word pictures that take place. The first has to do with uh, the idea of taking a coin and they would have a special punch that they would punch on the coin and it would have the imprint of the emperor on that coin and it would be an exact imprint. He's, he's the exact thing. But it's also a, a picture of a signet ring. We don't use those anymore. In fact, everything we do is email or faster than fast. But back in the day, you would write a letter, and to show that it was from you, not only would you sign it, but people, people couldn't always read or read well. So your signature could be forged, but the way you knew it was not forged was they would take their signet ring. They would dip it they would dip a little wax on the end of the, the envelope and they would impress the ring right down and it would leave your special mark that only you had. Jesus bears the special mark of God. The, the mark that says, this is God. And what it meant was everything in the envelope could be counted as the very words of the one who wrote it. Jesus is the very word of God. But I want you to see something else here. It also tells us that if you want to know the Father, you have to know Jesus. If you want to come to the Father, you go through Jesus, because the two are one. Notice what else it says. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He, we move from his role as prophet to priest. Purification of sins. This is the role of the priest, the sacrificial system. He's the one who intercedes between God and man to make sin right with God. But notice also, it says, sat down. That means his job was done. But it also means this, sat down at the right hand of the majesty. This is the picture of the king. This is the third thing we learn about him. He is not only prophet, he is not only priest, but he is king. He's greater than the prophet. He is the son. He's greater than the prophet. He's greater than the priest because he does not have to keep on doing sacrifices. He's done it once and it's done. And he is the greatest because he's greater than King David, his king them will not end. And because of this, 
The prophets gave instructions on how to be reconciled with God, but Jesus is greater because he does the work on our behalf. He does what we cannot do. Every sacrifice the priest gave could not fully cover our sins. It was just a placeholder, but Jesus, the great priest, gives us the greatest sacrifice. He himself covers our sins forever. He is the king who will always rule, and he will rule justly and wisely, and he will rule forever, and he will never lose his throne. Why? Because Jesus is greater. The writer says he's not only greater than any human you can think of, but he's greater than the angels. Both the prophets and the angels came to speak about God and his work, but I want you to see the next verse. And having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. What is that name? That name is the Son. He is the Son who is over the angels. He's greater than the angels. We live in an age where people are excited about angels. They want to study angels. They have angels and they see angels and all these things about angels. But friends, when someone comes and says, well, an angel told me, well, you say, I don't have to listen to the angel because I've listened to the Son. And if the angel disagrees with the Son, he's not an angel. He's in rebellion. But notice the, what it says about Jesus compared to the angels. Verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So we're going to see this process come all over again. Remember, we saw his identity. We saw his power. We saw his authority. Well, guess what? We're going to see his identity again. He is the son. This comes out of 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God is talking to David about Solomon. And he also, in that passage, sometimes when we read those passages, we get a little confused. How can this be about Jesus? It has to be just about Solomon. But here we're told, no, it, it had a dual purpose. It, it also meant Jesus. And you say, but, but when I read it, it says this. It says, um, if Solomon sins, God will discipline him. That can't be right. Well, hang on with me. Solomon is a picture of Jesus. He would sit on the throne of David. But unlike Jesus, he will sin and he will die. He will lose his throne. Jesus is the picture of David's ultimate son who will come to take the throne. And yes, he will be disciplined, but he will not be disciplined for his sin. He will be disciplined for ours. Because God said in Isaiah, he placed on him the sin of us all. We see his identity again, verse 6. And again, he, when he brings forth the firstborn to the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Therefore, whoops, my paper got stuck. But the son said, he, of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, he's calling him God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus is God. He is king and has authority over the angels. Now, I don't want you to go back and stumble on that word firstborn, as I read it earlier. It doesn't mean that he was born or he was created. It meant he had preeminence. He is supreme. He is the chief heir. He is in charge. And everything is, is created for him and for his use. We see his authority. We see his identity. All the angels worship him. He is the one to whom they bow. He is their king. He is their God. And then we see his power. And you, O Lord, verse 10, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will have no end. And to which of his angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool 
for your feet. Think about this. We just have heard the power of Jesus. He made the earth, the heavens. He won't die. He doesn't grow old. His years do not end. So I have a question for you. How big is your Jesus? My Jesus laid the foundation of the world. What are my problems compared to that? The heavens are simply his art project. They will perish, but my Jesus won't. My Jesus is perfect, so he doesn't have to change. Time has no meaning. Power is here, his. So to you this morning who might be tired and exhausted, to you who are worn out and barely holding on, the writers of Hebrews says, Behold your God. Turn to him. Rest in him. Friend, in the midst of this broken world, turn to Jesus. Start by remembering his greatness. A while back, I taught you a, a, something called gaze and glance, and I want to review that with you. We gaze at God and we glance at our problems. We don't ignore our problems. We don't say they don't exist, but we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Why? Because if I turn and fix my eyes on the problem and just glance at God, what happens is my problems become big and my God becomes small. But when I keep my eyes on Jesus and glance at my problems, I see everything in the right dimension. That I have a God who is big and a problem yet is real and powerful but nothing compared to him. So I want to encourage you to gaze and glance. Gaze at your Jesus. Glance at your problems. But what happens? What happens if I forget that, Pastor? Well, let's go on. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we heard lest we drift away. You see, the, the problems of life can overwhelm us. The problems of life can distract us. The problems of life can cause us to forget. We lose sight of the Magnificent One. We lose sight of Jesus. And the result is we begin to drift because our memories are too short. Chapter 2. Verse 2, for since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, get that, it's reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. In other words, sooner or later sin is dealt with. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard. In other words, it was declared by Jesus. It was backed up with witnesses. And then notice what God does. God intercedes and he says, And God also bore witnesses by sign and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Get that. The church itself when we come together, when we are with one another and we use our spiritual gifts with one another, we are confirming the message of Jesus Christ. So how do you remember? Number one, you listen to the message given by the angels that point to Jesus. Secondly, you remember that God is the true and fair and just judge. Thirdly, you remember that truth has been declared by Jesus. He told you what the truth is. And it's been backed up by witnesses. Fifth, God has given signs and wonders and miracles to confirm this message. This message is not just out there floating around. It's confirmed. Six, he has given us a church filled with spiritual gifts. 
gifts that confirm. And he has lastly strategically given all this according to his will, his power, his authority, his identity as prophet, priest, and king. So what do I want you to walk away with this morning? First, I have a question for you. How big is your Jesus? You can answer this by, by asking yourself three questions. Who is my Jesus? What is his identity? Is he God? Is he the son? Is he the heir? Or is he something else? What can he do? Is he the one who created everything and holds it together? Is he the one that does not have to change? Does he have the power this morning to meet my needs? And what does he have the right to do? Does he have authority? Authority over nature. Authority over sin and death and the grave. Authority over the angels. Is that who he is? And does he have authority over me? Do you need truth this morning? Then turn to Jesus, the prophet, who not only gives you God's word, but is God's worth. Do you need someone who has the power to meet you where, where you need the point of your need? Remember, Jesus is the greatest priest. He not only can bring you to God and intercede for you, but he has offered the ultimate sacrifice and has bore the penalty of God's judgment upon himself so he can reconcile you to God. Do you need a priest this morning? Do you need direction? Then let me take you to the greatest king. He is the one who the universe obeys and yet is personal and knows you intimately. We live in a world of pain. We live in a world that's broken. We live in a world that has tragedy both on big scales and small scales. Personal tragedy and community tragedy. And this morning, I want to give you hope. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Do you know who he is? Are you walking in his authority? Are you relying on his power? Is he your prophet? Is he your priest? Is he your king? If he is, Jesus is greater.